Hey, what's up? Welcome to another episode here on Entre Filmmaker with my interview series where I interview basically filmmakers, producers, directors, everyone who has kind of achieved something in the film world. And I'm really curious actually about, you know, not so much how they did it on the front end, let's say how they shot something or edited something, but more kind of the back end. Often there's never really being talked about how people fundraise, how they make the money, how successful a film was, or how they approach distribution. Today I have with me Roger Sherman. He is a photographer, cinematographer, director. He's a documentary filmmaker. What makes him really special is obviously his um, documentaries and his films. But in order to give you an idea who he is and what he has achieved as he was uh, nominated twice for the Oscars, won an Emmy, won Peabody Award, James Beard Award, and he works also with people like Ken Burns and found actually the production company. He's a very, very interesting person to talk to. He gave, gave me really insights about how he approaches filmmaking, the whole thing about um, how he comes up with concepts, what is worth his while and time to dedicate himself into his usually long-term projects, and then we talk also uh, about you know how he uh, approaches the, the festival, the film festival circuit, and last but not least, he's talking about the relationship and you know how it came about with him and Ken Burns. They studied together. I give a little couple snippets here away, and then founded a film company and how this all came to being. Without further ado, let's um, listen to the interview on my talk that I had with Roger Sherman. Let's go. Okay, okay, now I feel fully dressed. Then. You can do a you can do a jump cut. <laughs> the head needs to be. Yes, exactly. By the exactly. way, Roger, you're Jewish, right? I am you Jewish. Are? I say. What is Jewish? Jewish means I'm secular. I uh, is there such a thing like a secular Jew? There's just a Jew, no. I, I, yeah, yes, I don't know. I, uh, I was bar mitzvah. I was confirmed. I never had a thought of going to Israel until I was dragged there on a food press trip by Joan Nathan, the cookbook author. Right. In 2010. It was never on any kind of bucket list or, or anything. And, um, I just couldn't believe what what was there. I mean, the food is incredible. Such a small country, fresh tomatoes all year round. I lived there hot for the north, <coughs> cold in the north and hot in the south, and and everything is local. They don't know from locavore. You know, everything is local, and incredible people made more friends in Israel than I've made in years here. Um, and I came back and was telling people about this incredible trip and this amazing food and the great people. And I got two reactions. People either didn't believe me or they laughed at me. And I thought, aha, you've just discovered a great subject for a film. And that's where. Is that the Solomon, film, the Solomon of film? That's the film that, that I brought Michael Salamanov in, right. I and love so that film. I watched it in, in Philadelphia at the festival. And that, oh, that you saw, you saw it there. We saw it in the cinema. Yeah. It was really fantastic. We have also obviously a close, not obviously, we have a close relation with Salamanov in that sense that my sister-in-law was his first manager. I don't know if my wife talked about that. But yes, that, I heard that. And that means that, that I obviously met her a number of times. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and, and so for the people that, that haven't seen it, it's a portrait of the Israeli people told through food, conflict and all. And, you know, you ask about being Jewish. That film has changed my life. In what way? It's, um, well, back to I never felt like going and now all of a sudden I have this incredible connection to Israel and the Israeli people and the conflicts and the joys and um, Michael Solomonoff and I are, are brothers he a uh, mutual friend said 
let me step back a second. I don't like to use hosts in my films. I feel like a host, and most of the time a narrator also, removes the viewer a little bit from the experience. And I want to enmesh the viewer right inside. And I feel like any, any kind of host who's saying, and now we're going to do this, and now we're in, isn't this lovely? It's a distance. <laughs> but I realized... I realized that with Israel, I needed to find someone who knew all the cultures, was very familiar with all the cultures, with all the traditions. And a mutual friend uh, said, if you want the best Israeli cuisine in America, you've got to go to Zahav yes. and meet Michael Solomonoff in Philadelphia. This is way before he became famous, famous, famous. I think he had been best chef for the James Beard Awards for the Atlantic region, but, but not much else. And, uh, and now he, became, he was awarded best chef in the universe by the James Beard Award. And so we, I brought Do him you know over. if he has a Michelin star? He does not. That needs to be the next that, step. That'd be asking too much about Israeli cuisine. <laughs> no, but I mean for his restaurants, right? Like, it, you know, hopefully yeah, they're incredible. he's going there. Would be great. Yeah, they're, they're incredible. <laughs> so the way I dealt with having a host in, in that film is that Mike and I would talk about the scene we were about to shoot, the person we were about to meet. And I'd say, here are the kind of things that I'm interested in. And he'd say, Roger, what does the film mean? In, in search of Israeli cuisine in search of Israeli cuisine. And we'd go into a situation and I would just say, go for it. And I'd let him go. And when I felt like whatever subject it was that we had enough of, I'd say, okay, hang on. Can you now talk about this idea? Bang, they were back into it. And that's, that's how we did it. And Mike far surpassed my wildest expectations. He's such a mensch. He's so self-effacing, self-deprecating, so smart, makes everybody feel great. Awesome. never wants to talk down on anybody never so that that's really changed my life i've been to israel not that many times about five times i oh, hope yeah. to lead a trip we've now had the in search of his the official in search of israeli cuisine food tour nine times led by dia sabra and avi heights who's in the film twice and has a wonderful boutique travel company. And a year from now, a year, March, I will be leading a official In Search of Israeli Cuisine food tour. So I hope everybody comes who's watching. Beautiful. Um, yeah. Why I say that is I, I want to give you a kind of an overview why I wanted to meet. Um, I have just submitted my first short film and wanted to see what it's doing. Usually we are more in the ad space, doing ads and promotional stuff um, with a focus on nonprofits. So we did a film about a girl in India and we won like two pretty prestigious film festivals and we're taken uh, as official selection by two others. So it was for a first step. Um, I think a good, let's say, pilot test. I would call it a pilot test. Um, but there were so many questions. And someone like you who has like so many awards under his belt works so for such a long time in the industry, really with luminaries like Ken Burns and so on, Emmy Awards, Oscar nominations, the whole thing, everything you could want from. What I'm interested in, my audience primarily is, is we can search everything about how to edit a film, how to shoot a film. But you know where it's really missing is really the background logistics, as unsexy as they are. But they are really the bread and butter of every filmmaker. And my question, first question on that is, when you have a project like the Solomonoff project, a simple question from what do you live? How do you make a living while doing it? Is there someone behind it already that, that puts up the money up front? Do you need to, for this film that we made, 
well, I had to work. This was not paid by anyone, right? Obviously, this is different. It's a short film and it doesn't go anywhere other than just raising the profile. But I have seen yesterday that I was, I, I could not sleep. I tell you, I I, I watched your, your film about the uh, transgender Jamie. And it was just like, I mean, there's so many questions over there. How did you even get these intimate moments. But but again, that that might, if we have time, we will, might go there. But how do you finance such a thing that you are for such a long time following around those people? And, and you know, I have to tell you, like we research, we do a lot of things. It's very hard that anybody talks about those things. So this is what I'm personally interested. Everything but filmmaking, but it is around the filmmaking that affords us to do the filmmaking. Right. You've just uncovered the uh, terrible underbelly of documentary filmmaking. I don't like to say, but I say it often, the documentary film business is a misnomer. It's not a business. There are some documentaries and there they're, are becoming more and more that can uh, raise money and earn money. And, uh, there are ways to do it, but it's very, 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 very hard. If you don't have an absolute passion for a subject, it's, I'd say, forget about it. And the first rule for documentary filmmaking is raise the money before you start shooting. And- um, How so do you do that? How, let's say in your case, is there an example where you did that, let's say, you know, Shmuel, this is the majority of how I do that. I go to X, Y, and Z. How well, a lot, of, a, a lot of my projects have, have come to me or been work for hire. I get hired to make them. But In Search of Israeli Cuisine is a very good example. I uh, work through a nonprofit and I contacted people. I don't know if you've heard, but Israel has a little bit of a branding problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, um and I've, I'm not a fundraiser. And this was the first film that I actually raised the money for in my entire career. I've raised little bits of money, but not for the entire film. And um, so I thought, oh, I've heard that there's some fairly wealthy Jews in America that want to put Israel in a good light. And this would be, if, if I could raise money for any film, this, this could be it. And I went to met through networking lots of different people. I had a very difficult time and raised enough How would you approach them? I, I go really in the nitty gritty. How do you approach, let's say you have someone- Networking, you, address. you can't, you, you, you can only go through networking, a friend of a friend. Hey Shmuel, I hear your friend with this person. Can you introduce me? Because maybe they'll want to, you know, donate to the film. And then um, you get him. Okay, so I give you the contact, the phone number. Then what do you do with that? Then I send an email with a pitch and say, I'd love to meet you. I'd love to tell you more. Here's what I've done. Oscar nominations, all of that stuff. And um, some of the time, a small percentage of the time, I get a meeting. And if I get a meeting, I feel very good about that. Because once I get in the door, my passion can show and I can often convince somebody to give me money. I was raising actually for a, a film many years ago with um, you know, a big hedge fund guy. And he said, look, I'm asked to, to give money to, for an ambulance or should I give money to you? I said, no, don't give money to me, give money to the ambulance. Are you kidding me? He gave money to both. So. You know, I raised enough money to shoot the film. And that was fantastic. We had two cameras, we had local crew, we rented equipment over there, brought Mike over. Um, but then I couldn't edit. I didn't have enough money to hire editors and finish the film. And I did a Kickstarter campaign. And I thought, aha, if I can do a Kickstarter campaign, I can finish this film if I can raise a certain amount of, of money. And we did it. It you was the it. hardest thing I've ever done. 
I don't know that I'd ever do another one. I, you know, the people may still not be talking to me who I kept bugging. Yeah. <laughs> you know, wouldn't you rather give me 10 bucks than have me write you every week? And <coughs> we were able to finish the film and that's, that's how it was. There are lots of grants. There's some corporate money. It's, it's very, very, very difficult. It's not something I recommend. And in fact, I twice now have broken that first rule of documentary filmmaking, get the money first. I completely self-funded the second life of Jamie P. And let me just describe it briefly for That's the film I was audience. talking about. That was just insane. Yeah. Yeah. Jamie Peebles and I went to college together. We went to Hampshire College in Western Massachusetts, a, a very forward, some people call it experimental liberal arts college. Was that together Decades with Ken also, that he was also in, in your group? Ken Burns was part of our class too, and he and I became college roommates, and we started Florentine Films together right after college. And so Jamie and I have been friends for over 40 years. And when she came to me and said, I'm, well, basically, she always thought she was a man until like a bolt of lightning, as she describes it, at age 63, she realized she's a woman. And I followed her emotional, revelatory, and often funny transition for a year. Yes. And, but there was no time to fundraise. I needed to be there while she was going through a horrible time in her life. Her brother, who I also knew because he was at Hampshire as well, they were like twins. And um, he still hasn't spoken to her five or six years later. Friends said she was dead to them. Her family, especially one of her daughters, took it very, very hard, as you saw in the film. And if I had waited a year to try to raise money, all the of this would have been over. Passed. And all most done. of the films that you see about transgender experience are after the fact. And we talk about, oh, I had a hard time with my mother. And the mother says, yes, we had a hard time. Well, here it is, the daughter saying this was impossible, the, the ex-wife of three years saying my whole marriage, I call it into question. I just don't know what to think of it. After 30 so years I had of to marriage. start right away. I had to start right away and I completely self-funded that film. And I'm glad I did because it's won a bunch of awards. It's, it's streaming everywhere. People can find it on YouTube and iTunes and Amazon and those places. And Jamie really wasn't interested in doing it. She was too overwhelmed with her transition and she didn't want to be the subject of a film. She's a, a genius. She is, uh, was a genius audio engineer. She, she did all the engineering for Al Gore's current TV. And, uh, and other kinds of things. She's a taught, talker. she's been a filmmaker. She's just, she's a genius, but she didn't want to be the focus. We talked all that summer while I was basically on the phone with her, being there for her and inside saying, please agree to do this film, please agree to do this film. And Ken Burns called her up and said, you got to get Roger to do this film. So finally, when she realized it could help people understand the transgender experience better and answer many of the questions like you said you had, then she decided to do it. And so, yeah, that's... The shocking yeah, thing about that is... Fundraising is there. The shocking thing about the film, and then we go back to, to the, the background of that, is the question that with everyone lingers is what is sex like? What is, you know, orgasm? What, what does it even look like? You did not shy away to address all of this. And I think this is where the power is coming from. There's many, many films being done about the subject, but they seem to avoid that elephant in the room that you are male. I'm a male. That's our first question. What are they, are they cutting off the schlong and that's it? Or what are they doing? And you can't just go and ask someone that you even assume that right. that was right. 
And right. I mean, the trust building, I suspect, came from the past shared experience. Is that correct? It would probably be a much harder thing to do. But here's yes. the other question. I give you that. And that sounds to me like, okay, that, that you could, could pull off. But where I bow down in front of you is, how did you get everyone else to be on that same level? The daughter, the husband of the daughter, they're you bring them together and there they talk and, and elaborate. What is it that you do that you do this trust building on such a level that almost the camera is not there? Shmuel, you want me to give up my secrets? I don't even know you. <laughs> it's, it's what I do. It's what I have worked on for decades. Interviewing is the key. In my films and in every film, it's all about the people you interview. It's all about the people that are there. And I have developed ways to get people to trust me, to sort of put their arm around me and say, come on, let me show you, let me take you for a ride. And, you know, I did a film called Medal of Honor, the history of the highest medal for valor and combat that our nation gives out. And I interviewed 12 living Medal of Honor recipients. You know, I was a little nervous about talking to them. I mean, some of these people were, you know, very much trained to do their jobs. And, you know, they could probably kill me without taking their hands out of their pockets. And um, two wives sat in on the interviews and both of them said, he said things to me, he said things to you in the film that he's never said to me. And these are guys that have, they're so famous for what they've done that they could book speeches 365 days a year. And I was really concerned with how am I gonna get them to come past that wooden, and I did this and I did this and yes. I did this. Yes. And my technique, is, it's, it's the same, but it's different in that, circumstance, I basically wore them down. Not only did I talk to them so that I would gain their trust, but I didn't just sit down with them and say, so tell me about that action that you did in Vietnam or Korea 50 years ago. I said, what kind of a kid were you? Were you a bad kid, a good kid? What was your family like? What was the town like? So I got them talking about things that were very, very familiar that I knew would be thrown away. And then it, for some of them, it was a half an hour before we started talking about war, still not their action. Tell me what war is like, I would ask. What does it sound like? What does it taste like? What is, what, what is happening there when you're in war? So by the time I said, okay, take me back to that day, we were pals. We were just, you know, getting, we'd gotten to know each other. And, um, and so that's what happened. Sorry for the beeping. No, um, I don't hear it. It's good. Good. So yeah, it's, it's different in everyone, but mostly it's, it's relaxing and getting them to relax in whatever way um, whatever way creating a bond, do. right? They're creating creating a friendship in some way, having an interest on the person, not just for the product, but but even probably asking questions beyond of the scope of a film, or so. Just because we're, I mean, you exactly. and I, I suspect we're curious people. Otherwise, you wouldn't do what we do. Right. Going back to the to the financial piece, that that so basically, what I heard from you saying is making a living from documentary filmmaking is not just difficult, but almost impossible. What, what have you found strategies that it kind of seemed to work out for you? For example, how are you planning or how did you plan or maybe achieved already to bring back the investment or beyond for the Jamie film or for the Solomonov film? Well, the Jamie film, I don't know that I'll ever, 
it's going to be a long term process and um, finding distribution today is very difficult. Um, the meaning meaningful film festivals, meaningful yeah. distribution, meaning you can self distribute, but but it, it might not be meaningful. Exactly. Meaningful to me means that you can get the word out and lots of people would get to see it and you can sell it to Netflix, which we did for In Search of Israeli Cuisine, or you can sell it to other things or you have, um, you know, most of the film festivals, Sundance this year had 17,000 entries. Unless you have a sales agent, unless you have a distributor that knows the people on side, the chances of you breaking through something like that are, are very, very, very difficult. So I, in the Jamie film, I hired an aggregator company that puts it on Amazon and, and YouTube and those kinds of places, Apple TV. Um, with Israeli cuisine, I had a distributor and they far surpassed my wildest expectations. How did you get that? Um, but another, how did you get that distributor for, for the that Solomon? Distributor came, that, that distributor came to me. And all I have to say is if someone is looking for a distributor and you're having conversations and they're interested, you have to check the distributor out. You have to say, give me six names of people that you're distributing. But another, in terms of In Search of Israeli Cuisine, I realized I could perhaps extend and extend my brand a little further by creating what I'm calling the new face of Israeli cuisine. I had tons of material that didn't make it into the film. We shot 200 hours for whatever it is, an 80 minute film. And I had cut scenes and I thought, and, and whenever I would present the film at film festivals, one of the questions always was, what's next? And finally I thought, what's next? I have next. So I created the new face of Israeli cuisine, which is an interactive conversation. It's an event, not start to finish film. I show a scene, then I talk about it and get the audience to ask questions. I show another scene. I talk about it, get the audience to ask questions. If you go to my website, florentinefilms.com slash Sherman, you can click on Israeli cuisine, or if you just Google in search of Israeli cuisine, you'll find it and you can see samples of, of how that works. Well, I was traveling around and I was a keynote speaker just about exactly two years ago today, it came up on my Facebook page. Um, that I was the keynote speaker at the Vermont Jewish Communities Annual Conference. Lots of small shuls get together and they exchange ideas. And I brought the new face to Israeli cuisine. I think it might've been the only, only the second time I'd done it. And um, so I was traveling around doing it. And the last time I presented it live was at the El Paso Jewish Film Festival where tickets sold out so quickly, they put a second show on. It was the best attended event at the entire film festival. And wow. two weeks later, the world shut down. Yeah, sure. And I had three events in um, Canada, that were can Canada that were canceled. And so I thought, okay, let's make another opportunity. I mean, you really have to be an entrepreneur to be in this business. And that opportunity was to take it virtual. And so now I do what we're doing and I show a scene virtually and I talk about it with the guests and it's about an hour, but I did it recently for a group in um, Oakland, California. They were so into it, it lasted almost two hours. Wow. And I'm making a few shekels. It's not something that I'm going to retire on, but it's fun and they don't have to pay for my travel and I don't have, you know, it's, to go for an hour to any place USA or Canada is two days, you know, with all the travel. And so anyway, so that's been, that's been great. And I'm booking new uh, events all the time for that. So that's, you know, you just have to think, how can I, you know, and back to your fundraising question, every film is different. So, you wouldn't go to whatever the shorts that you made. You probably wouldn't go to the people that I went to 
unless it's a very Israeli subject. You know, if it's a film about the effect of divorce on children, which is a film I did called Don't Divorce the Children, you're not going to go to Israelis. You're going to try to find foundations and other people that care about that subject. And that's how you focus in and, and try to raise money. By the way, you have children? I do. Tell me about it. <laughs> Any children? What are they doing? My, my son, Lincoln, turned 28 on um, Sunday. Yeah. He's working, looking for a new job. Our stepdaughter, Sandrine, has an eight-year-old in a week on the second. I hope, Aster, you're not watching because we're supposed to come up and surprise you. <laughs> and they have moved out of the city for a year. Um, and, you know, we're all doing, doing what we can. What are they doing? Like, like job wise, do they follow in the footsteps of, you know, you, their dad or your, the mom? Like I, 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 I remember if I remember correctly, your wife is a writer, right? And an, an editor of a my wife magazine. Was a, uh, my wife was a magazine editor. Magazine editor. She founded. She founded a very, very influential food magazine called Savour. Yes. Uh, her name is Dorothy Kalins. And she, that magazine changed the world of food magazines. And I got into uh, I, going way back. I wanted to be a, a photographer. And I had dropped out of college and I found myself in Western Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts, working in a photo store. And I discovered Hampshire College, and it was two years old. And thought, aha, maybe it's time to go back to school because I wasn't being successful as a photographer. I was very, very young. Anyway, when I met Dorothy and we started getting together, we would travel and she would we'd go to a, <coughs> a restaurant or, or someplace and she'd say, take pictures. And I became a food photographer. Uh, and a garden okay. photographer because she had another magazine she started called Garden Design. And so whatever little I know about food really comes from her impetus. I did another film called The Restaurateur, which is a portrait of Danny Meyer, who you might not know his name, but you certainly know his restaurants. Shake Shack, Gramercy Tavern, Union Square Cafe, The Modern. And uh, I followed the creation of two restaurants, 11 Madison Park, which ended up getting four stars, and Tabla, an Indian-themed restaurant. And that also is available on Vimeo and, and some other, other sites. And um, so, yeah, I love shooting food. I love being a food photographer. And um, yeah, don't know what the next thing is, but... I've just finished a film called The Soul of a Farmer. And it's a 35-minute short about an amazing woman named Patty Gentry who farms on Long Island. Her landlord is Isabella Rossellini, famous actress and activist, who says, Patty, she's the Picasso of vegetables. So she's a character and she's great in the film and that is now finished and we're in the festival circuit and we're looking for a distributor who knows if it will happen and i hope it will be out uh in the summer so i saw that one too how did it come about that film self-funded was um, there someone that said roger <laughs> it was again <coughs> self-funded you violated your rule the third time No, twice, twice in a row. Okay. I thought Solomonov, the no, J. Solomonov, we raised the money for. Oh, okay. Solomonov, okay, fine. Yeah. In Search of Israeli Cuisine, I raised the money for. The Second Life of Jamie P., I self funded. And yes. um, well, it's a funny kind of story because I'm a cinematographer and I shoot all my own stuff. And we had a cottage on Long Island in East Mauritius, which we called the non-trendy pre-Hamptons because no one's ever heard of it. And it's the exit before you get off for the Hamptons where you have another hour to go depending on traffic. And we had 10 minutes and 
We met Patty because her farm was in the neighborhood at that time. She had since moved. And we just fell in love with her. She's so smart and so passionate and so into everything. I can't wait to grow this and you're going to love it. And um, I didn't have a camera at the time. Uh -huh. It was a transition from the uh, the little, what do they call them? The little tape camera, the tapes. Mini the end of that mini DV, exactly. Too digital. So that was the DSLR, the DSLR the trend, anymore. It was the transition from yeah, and, to DSLR, right? Well, I've never used a DSLR, but other digital cameras, you know, that were memory cards and things like that. <laughs> My wife said, you know, <coughs> you can't be a filmmaker without a camera. And I said, yeah, but the cost. And she said, no, oh, you can't be a filmmaker without a camera go buy a camera. And so I did, and instantly I knew who I wanted to make a film about, and it was Patty. And it was almost at the same moment that Jamie started her transition. So I actually filmed both of them at the same time. You know, you're not filming every day. Um, and, you know, t technically one thing back to the, um, film the second life of jamie p which you wouldn't have known well yes actually you would you saw that jamie does these video diaries yes where she puts a gopro in her car which is the place she felt most comfortable i had to balance being there for her being her friend of 40 years and being the director saying i really need you to do this as hard as it is. So Jamie would call me after some awful thing had happened. Some doctor would he her, misgender her. Some person would, you know, do some slur at her. You know, when am I going to stop being just some guy in a dress? She says in the film, crying. She would call me all upset and I would be there for her. And then I'd say, Jamie, you need to go out to your car and you need to tell your audience this story. And she did that dozens and dozens and dozens of times. It could make a whole other film or YouTube videos or something, which I, if I ever get less busy, maybe that's the next project to do. Um, and, it, and it really worked, really worked well, you know, that, that she was able to do that because she's up in outside of Boston and I'm here in New York City. I wasn't able to go every time something happened, although I was in the operating room and I did film her surgery and people are now watching you and I going, what? <laughs> and as you saw, the challenge as a cinematographer was to film the surgery and as a director, because I'm constantly directing myself and also firing the cameraman very, very frequently, me, the cameraman. Um, basically, the challenge was to film the surgery without showing the surgery. I got that. A little tiny this. bit of blood. Yep. There's, you know, so you're there, you're in it. And the doctor, Dr. Marcy Bowers, is world renowned. She happens to be transgender. And so she narrates the story of what she's doing. And I could ask her any question while she's there doing the surgery. And she was so open and so wonderful. Um, and so, you know, every film's a challenge. Every film you'd think after doing it for decades that it would just come naturally, but it doesn't. It, it parts of it do, parts of it is, Semi autopilot. I can do this. I can do that. I can do this. I can do that. But then it's the challenge of did I get enough? Did I ask the right questions? When I'm in the interview, am I asking the right questions? What else is there? I'll give you another hint, but you have to promise not to tell anybody. I want everybody to raise their hand. Raise your hand, Shmuel, that you can't tell anybody. The follow-up question is always more 
important than the question itself. And then the follow up to that. And I, you know, in my younger days, I started out when we started Florentine Films as a sound man. And I would work freelance. And, you know, I worked with anchors of major networks and all. And they would come with their notes and they would ask a question. They wouldn't listen. They'd ask the next question. They wouldn't listen. And I wanted to throttle them saying, you're missing so much because the follow-up question. And that gets the person more, um, more relaxed, more into it, more passionate. So anyway, I didn't finish telling you about the soul of a farmer. It's, you know, Patty films three acres. She was a chef. She sells to the top chefs on, in Brooklyn, just award-winning, incredible chefs. But the film really bursts the romance of Farm to Table. For those of us who can afford to buy at farmer's markets or directly from the farmer, it's an incredible, wonderful thing. For the farmer, sitting across from us at the table, it's a constant, constant struggle. And that's what you'll get by watching The Soul of a Farmer. You'll see Patty's passion. You'll fall in love with her. You'll see how wonderful she is and the joys of what she does. And you'll also see how really, really difficult farming is. Now, when you look for projects, what is your methodology let's say your matrix to decide whether or not you pursue the subject. I'm sure there's an influx of a lot of things. And since we established you're a curious person, you could make films about a million things every day, every week, every month. What's your methodology to figure out this is what I'm pursuing? I can answer that in one word, money. What is it? Your money. Money, money, money. There are tons of great ideas, but to raise the money, to get the money, to have the money is, as we've been discussing, next to impossible. So unless either the money is there or unless one thinks they can really raise the money, it's not worth, it's not worth doing. There's so many niche topics that are great, but how many people are going to want to watch it so yeah that's it's very hard it's so i've been very fortunate i've been i've been very very fortunate in the films i've been able to make because i noticed i have a note here saying that you are a festival strategist you don't do just i, I we could tell because we are in marketing and we see when someone does something very like our attempt with these festivals was just you know, apply to a couple hundred and see what sticks, right? But you, you have a topic, let's say food, and then you reach out to the most prestigious award that, by the way, has also a film festival, like the, the what's it called? The Beard, James Beard Award. Is that correct? And then, boom, you are there. And maybe the competition is not as huge, let's say, like in Sundance, because it's kind of a nichier thing. But if you do your homework right and you get honored by them, well, that's then. So talk to me about those strategies, because you have done this a number of times. This is not the only time. Talk yeah, to me about how you discovered that and what you're doing that I, as a, let's say, starter, what should be my yeah. three steps to make that work like you? I, I wish I had a good insight and a good answer to that question. The restaurateur did win a James Beard Award as best documentary feature. Um, there are thousands of film festivals. And yes, the first thing is to apply to film festivals that are close to your topic. So I'm applying right now to farm and food film festivals for the soul of a farmer. But if you, you know, there's a fantastic website called Film Freeway, filmfreeway.com. It's, it's an organization that aggregates all, not all, but many of the film festivals. And you can look them up by subject, by length, by country, by 
by anything. And it's very, very helpful. The problem is that most independent film festivals describe themselves in exactly the same way. And it's impossible to know the difference. There are people that say film festivals don't matter. Well, if you have a lot of money for promotion, maybe film festivals don't matter as much. When uh, Jamie was released, uh, the, soul, the Second Life of Jamie P, my intention was to get into a bunch of film festivals so that I could redo the poster and have it covered with laurels. So that if you went to Amazon, which by the way, has just decided not to car carry documentaries and shorts, which is just, it's a pretty horrible thing. Do you know the um, reason why? No, they never say the reason why. It's probably a business reason. They're not getting much money back from short films. And, and um, a documentary? So if you happen to, sorry? Documentary shorts, I understand, but documentary films, Netflix has been quite successful with, uh, with documentaries, right? Yeah, so has Amazon, but uh -huh. they're stopping most, most of that kind of thing. Hulu too, they, they all have them. Um, so my strategy was that if somehow you came upon the poster or something about the film, you would see that this film has a bunch of festivals. And we were lucky, we, I got to, you know, best international at one, best director at one, but most of them are official, what do they call Election. it? You, official selection. Accepted. Yes, official selection. People don't read those things. People just see, oh my God, there's a dozen, fe dozen festivals. So maybe they'll want to watch the film more. I think there's a, uh, I think you could do too many. I think a couple hundred, it's expensive, especially if you're paying for it yourself. Um, so I would apply to ones in your topic area and some others, especially if you are in a place like uh, since Patty, the soul of a farmer is on Long Island and she sells to these very famous, well-known chefs in Brooklyn, I'm applying to every New York City film festival. I don't care how small it is. And in my cover letter, I say, and you know, I guarantee you that quite a few of people in your audience will know these these chefs. And my hope is that they'll go, oh, that will bring more people to the festival. More people will pay to watch. Um, so that's that's something that you can do too, is, is focus in on, on that kind of nitty gritty stuff. Let's pivot. Um, I read, picked up somewhere that you are also involved, I think, I'm not sure if it was like overseeing, but uh, jury-like festivals, right? You were involved with a festival of some festivals. Is that correct? Yeah, I've been on a number of, of festival boards, uh, but right now I'm on the advisory board of uh, Hampton's Doc Fest, which is, is based in, in Bridgehampton. And it's a wonderful small film festival. In fact, film festivals are fantastic. And if people have any opportunity to go to a film festival, to buy a pass, just to walk in and out, you can see films that you'll never ever see because they won't reach distribution. And my rule of never going to a film if it's already started, I throw out the window and I go in and out. If I don't like it in 10 minutes, I leave, I go into another one, especially the big, the big film festivals. Um, But Hampton's Doc Fest is a great small festival. We honored Frederick Wiseman, the iconic cinema verite filmmaker this past year. Uh, D.A. Pennybaker, we honored a few years back and he's lived in Bridgehampton and, and came to all the festivals, all the screenings um, with his wife, Chris Hedges. And I was, and he again is, is one of the icons of cinema verite. He, he died just a few years ago. And, I was very fortunate to 
become somewhat friends with him to sit down a number of times and have conversations. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a it's a fun thing to do. The reason why I ask you is then when we did this festival circuit, there were a lot of things that were totally unknown to me. Premier status, you know, lots of personal question, what sexuality you have, all of that stuff. And our film, so and where, where it really hit for me was, our film was selected for Big Sky. Are you familiar with Big Sky? Yeah, good. So, and is it an environmental film? Uh, yes, it, but it's about um, a young 10-year-old girl is one of the garbage pickers at Asia's third largest um, garbage trash yeah. mountain in New Delhi. And it, it was very... So, so, yes, so Big Sky was the perfect choice for that film because they like environmental films. So absolutely. So, you know, so here's uh, my next question. What, what I want to hear from you as someone who works behind the scenes, I encountered the following thing that I could not make sense of. So it's official selection, and then they have competition. In the competition, there are in each category 10 films. So I looked at it. Our film was not selected. So I looked at the other films, and we are data people. We look at what do have the what do the films have all in common that there might be or might not be selected. So I noticed that one was that most of them had a world premiere, and the second one was most uh, the second most ones was uh, let's say a northwest premiere. So I'm writing them back and ask them: Is it possible? I see that it's world premiere, and You know, our film was for United States premiere. That's all just what I clicked on because, right? I didn't know better. So I asked, was that the main reason why our film was not selected for the competition? Because I saw this as one of the common things. Um, and behind and the reason was not because I thought, oh, our film must be better than everybody else, but we got we are in talks or we we they they came to us and want to feature the film in the festival for some other programming that's there, but they didn't let us come in into the competition. So I wrote back and I got the answer back. Well, we saw that you had laurels already from these other LA festivals. Isn't it that they were played there? So I want to know what is it, how you as a filmmaker can screw it up, even if the film would be perfect, good enough competition, maybe even win, but you could screw it up because You submit it to a festival that's maybe second, third grade. They take it, and then Big Sky or Sun or whoever else says, "No, we don't take it because it was already over there." What is it that the festival needs from their perspective to say, "This is the film"? Yeah, it's 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 different with every festival, and I can't answer that. We don't have a competition at Hamptons Doc Fest in that same way. Um, we give out an environmental award an art award, um, then there's an audience award, which obviously the audience votes, but we don't have a competition like that. But there are festivals that are pretty finicky about world premieres or local premieres or whatever. And um, I'm dealing with that right now with the soul of a farmer. I may have to pull out of two festivals that we've just gotten into because there's a big festival that I don't want to, you know, kabosh my chances right so so you're saying yeah. this is this there is not like one theme that when you hit those things so for example what i was wondering as a question when we submitted should we already the lords at film freeway right you can always resubmit and exchange and update things should we now put the laurels of film festivals we won already put on the poster or in the beginning of a trailer so other film festivals would see, you know, it's like seed investing. Once you have the first an angel investor, other investors want to come and jump on board. Is that something that works with right. film festivals as well? Or is it that they say, no, we don't want this to be shown anywhere. We want to be the first one discovering the film or the filmmaker. It's a good question that I can't answer. I think every festival would be different. There are quite a few of the films that we put into Hampton's Doc Fest have won major festivals before. We're a small festival. Right. So we can't do that. And so, you know, Big Sky, they wanted to be that. You've got to read very carefully 
the uh, the instructions for submission. And if it's a festival that you really, really want to be in, then you've got to think of what to do with your other festivals. Do you not promote it? Do you not put it on the poster yet? Do you, uh, I don't know. I wish I had an answer for that one. And even from your experience, you couldn't see like a commonality, like in more cases of work no. that way or that way. No, because most festivals, they say right out, we will not tell you. We will not give you feedback. We will not tell you why you didn't get in. So don't bother asking. So I'm kind of interested that you got, they got back to you. Although since they told you that you were going to be in some other area, I guess that made it okay for them to reveal their reasoning. Definitely. Um What is it? What is the most important thing for you uh, in the doc? Oh, by the way, I want to be respectful of your time. How much more do I have with you? It's not that much anymore, but I want to want to see you. You know, check in. I with I think if if we stopped in another two to three hours, that would be that would be fine. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. By the way, I really appreciate that. No, seriously, it's an oh, honor it's to talk to, to you. Yeah, it's an honor to talk to you and having seen your work and 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 I'm glad that I came across not just oh you know who should we interview but it was like Roger was already through the Solomonov connection and that we you know it's one thing to see it oh you know like I've seen your film yesterday on Vimeo okay it's one thing but we saw it right then and there on a big screen and that's obviously what you would want right when you make put all this exactly. effort and and money and 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 sweat in it i mean you want this to be in the best possible way um exactly in terms of we go back to documentary um what do you think makes or breaks a good document or a documentary film in, in general meaning what makes a film really great or really sucker but you cannot answer good story And good lead actors or 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 subjects like the the protagonist. You ready? Yes. It's one word. It's one word. Editing. Ah. Editing. Tell me more. A film, a film could be made or broken in the editing. Um, the editing is. For me, as difficult and challenging as filming is, working 10, 12 hour days, compared to the editing, it's like dessert. I mean, I just love shooting. I just love shooting and I'm available as a freelancer. I'll shoot your film for you. Um, and I'll work, I work, I work with directors to try to make it the best and I don't take over, it's your film. But editing, You know, back to something we touched on earlier that I've been working at this so long and there's certain things I can do. I'm pretty certain that I can make a good film. Of any film that I make, I can make a good film. Can I make a great film? I don't know. And that's where the editing comes in. The best editors, first of all, to have a budget, which I've had budgets for my entire career until the second life of Jamie P that were large enough that I could hire the top editors in the country. Wow. It's such a gift. It's such a wonderful thing. And I'm so humbled by that, by, you know, having had such been so fortunate in my career to have made films like that I've made. Um, on many different subjects because most documentary filmmakers, even ones that are successful like me, we can't choose our subjects all the time. Um, so, and I like that. I like being able to do a lot of different things. So I've been able to hire the best editors. Editors, it's a very interesting um, personality. They have to be incredibly smart. They have to, be able to pick apart a story. They have to be able to, they have to be technically very, very proficient. And they have to be able to work together with the director in a calm way. There's nothing worse than 
than working with an editor who's just tense and always, you know, wait, stand by, stand by, hold on. You know, an hour later, you haven't gotten anywhere. There's one personality trait that every good editor has that I don't understand. Because of all the things I've just said, that's a very particular kind of person. The best editors are willing like that to give up their idea and say, it's your film. Is that the way you want it? Fine. And to me, if you are so smart and so passionate and you do it so well, why wouldn't you fight to the death? Well, it's not as if me and my editors don't have strong conversations about, I like this, no, I like this, we should do this, no, we should do this, okay, let's try this. You know, film is an incredibly collaborative media. And I'm very happy to have suggestions from even the production assistant can make suggestions. It can only make suggestions at appropriate times, not while there's tension and other things going on. And, you know, it's like, hello, can we do this? But that's a pretty amazing trait. And that collaboration in the editing room, I don't live in the editing room. I might, at the beginning of a project, when we're just starting to put it together, I might not go to the editing room for two or three weeks because the editor doesn't need me there sitting over her shoulder commenting on things. She's working things out. She's figuring things out. I come in when I'm needed and then we make decisions together. But, you know, I've used on most of my films a fantastic composer named Tease Gold. And we were doing Alexander Calder, the first film that I worked on with him uh, as a composer. And there was this scene and he's trying to compose music for it. And he says, you know, the scene doesn't work. And here's the composer telling the director that what the director and the editor have done doesn't work. It's like, there are people, filmmakers who would go, excuse me? You're the composer, take a walk. No, 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 he was absolutely right. And I hadn't seen it. And so, yeah, it's sort of be open, be flexible as a filmmaker. That's as important as anything. You know, you're, you're out there, you're shooting, you've got a very intense production schedule and something pops up. Would you like to do this? I was doing a film on country music uh, called the rhythm of my the rhythm of my soul in uh, eastern Kentucky, you know, and you always have a schedule that you can never keep up with. And the father of this the guy who was the leader of the band, and we were filming them singing in the opening of the, the door of the barn. It was classic, classic country stuff. The father comes out of the barn central casting he's got this incredible beautiful cowboy hat he's got a mustache like this and boots and all he said would you like to go to an auction tonight a horse auction shit yes <laughs> and that's a scene in the film and if you gotta push things around flexibility wow what are your morning routines a general morning. What do you do in the first half of your day when you wake up? I get up, I take a run. I used to take a run with my dog, but she's now too old to run. Um, come back, take a shower, have breakfast, make breakfast for Dorothy. As I said, she comes out of the food world. I married very well. She's an incredible cook. Um, then I come into the office and I... Depending, if I have deadline, I will, on my notebook, I keep these, a notebook. Yes, yes. This notebook started on March 29th, 2019. And every day, or I put a date down. And so... I can go back over my pages because it's all about systems. I don't care what you do, whether you're a filmmaker or doesn't matter. It's about getting systems that work for you. I equate 
making a foam with juggling a hundred balls at once. Inevitably, you're going to drop one of those balls. If you make that a crisis, you better go do something else. If it's just, okay, now I've got this challenge. How am I going to overcome that challenge? Overcome that challenge. I pick up the ball, I throw it up, and I'm back to juggling 100 balls. When the next one? So if I'm on a deadline, I won't, I'll check email, but I won't necessarily reply to emails. I'll just see what's going on in the world. But I'll make a list of all the things that I have to do so I'm not distracted from the work that's really important. And I will do that for as long as I can, two, three, four hours, try to do it through lunch. Then I'll come back to my list and I'll start doing other things, or I may not get to it for two days. It really, really depends on, on what the project is and what's, what's going on. What do you eat for breakfast? Usually. <laughs> uh, this morning? Usually. A piece of toast and cream cheese. I don't have a usual. <coughs> toast, oatmeal, a bagel. Uh, I make my own granola. So granola and um, yogurt with fruit. Smoothies. Depends on the season. You know, we don't get much good stuff here right now. But Any sports? What do you have for breakfast? What do you have uh, for breakfast? I try to intermittent fast at least twice a week, if not almost every day, because I eat only two meals. And then for breakfast right now, I'm on a regiment, only steak, chicken, and tomatoes. For, for steak? Brunch. Steak, chicken, and tomatoes. Huh. And then I have a milchig meal at the end of the day, avocado, nuts, maybe a little salad or so. Um, what would you think is... If someone thinks in my audience, and this could obviously include me too, what are the things that an aspiring or starting filmmaker needs to bring? It's a long journey. You outlined it so eloquently. It is tough. It needs passion. It needs grit. It needs perseverance through really dark times, especially self-doubt. I'm sure that's familiar to you in some way or another too. What is it that, let's say, let's boil it down to, let's say, three to five things When someone wants to go onto this journey, what do they, what should they bring to the table to say, these are the three to five things you should see if you have any of them or you can develop them. And then that might bring you on an, on a career, on a successful path. Is there anything? Have you thought, I mean, you have your own, you know, your own metrics yeah, that you used. A couple of them can be done sort of at the same time. Um, we have a very good apprenticeship system in filmmaking, whether you're doing documentaries or commercials or narrative, and it's called being a production assistant and being working with experienced people. Yeah, you're carrying cameras and you're going and getting coffee. But if you're keeping your eyes open, you can learn so much. And you could keep a little notebook, especially people that want to learn how to light the gaffers, people that want to learn how to shoot. Um, you do diagrams of every setup. Here's the camera. There's a key light here. There's a fill light here. There's a back light here. There's a light of, that goes to the bookcase that's over there. And you just got to be eyes wide open. And the more you can do of that production assistant, you can move into the right places. And it's all about networking. And it's a very frustrating because nobody wants to hire somebody they don't know. And you've got to call and call and call and call the same places over and over again. Not enough to become, you know, a jerk. Because you're only going to get the first PA job when that person that usually hires unavailable and now you've called enough that says, oh yeah, Shmuel, you've called five times, right? Haven't you? Wow. Okay. You know, next Monday we've got this shoot, but you've got to keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. 
And as you get more experience, you can say, I'd like to do more of this. I'd like to be your producer. So maybe you have, depending on the size of the company, maybe you have PAs in the office. Could I do that? Could I try that? Finding people to ask questions and be mentors with. Again, not in the way, you know, in the middle of a shot, but at lunch or something else. Can I call you when you're not working? So that's one side of it. The other side of it is to make films. I mean, these, <laughs> this is an unbelievable camera. This shoots 4K 24P. Now I shot 4K with my um, Sony FS5. It's a great camera, it's not that expensive. That was the camera that I bought when Dorothy said you can't be a filmmaker. And I was out at Patty's farm trying to do pickups and I didn't have, didn't know I was gonna go there. And so I turned the camera on 4K and I, I shot maybe 10 shots, 10 different places, locations at the farm that afternoon. The light was spectacular. And six of them made it into the final film <laughs> because- A lot. And, and my colorist couldn't tell the difference. So just start making movies. Don't think about selling. Don't think, I mean, we all have, and I remember when I was in college, thinking, oh, what am I gonna make a film about? That's not important enough. Oh, that's not important enough. Oh, that's not, enough. and you waste your time by not doing, instead of saying, I'm gonna learn how the craft of filmmaking happens. I'm gonna learn how the craft of shooting, and then I'm gonna critique myself up the wazoo. God, I'm not holding the camera steady. Oh, I'm not, this, the light looks terrible. I can't believe it. Oh, that's pretty good. Look how I did that. You know, I'm also an author. I wrote a book called Ready, Steady, Shoot, um, a prose guide to smartphone video. And it gives you all the basics of how to start making films. And then you look at your stuff, you look at what you've got, and you start editing and you use Final Cut or iMovie or anything that's really simple. It doesn't have to cost much. And you don't have to finish, finish, finish it like it's going to go on YouTube or be distributed. But again, you got to step back and be a really tough critique and go, okay, what's next? I'm going to do a film about, you know, in my book where I have videos that uh, are learning videos and I say, here, you can do this too, but I'll show you in my house. I video, uh, they're called 10 shot videos, a whole film in just 10 shots. Most of them not moving the camera. Definitely not zooming. I say zooming is death because you can't hold steady if you're zooming. Most people, unless you're a very experienced cameraman, said, take a film of your room. My room? Yeah, the place you've been in a jillion times. Can you look at it in a new and different way? I use my living room to do that. And then I said, okay, now do another one. Same room, same idea. And it's amazing what you can learn from, in a sense, a film about nothing. But what you're doing is you are developing the craft. You're developing the skills of, of film. So you want to do that as, as often as you possibly can. If you could possibly do one a week, you'd be a filmmaker before you knew it. And then you're earning money by being a production assistant. If you want to learn to be an editor, here's a secret. Editors make more money than anybody. Editors never are out of work. So if you want to be an editor, learn Final Cut, learn Adobe Premiere. Um, and then look for jobs as an assistant editor or as a second assistant editor and work your way up and work with great editors. And before you know it, you'll be an editor. And the classic move to becoming a filmmaker is from editor to filmmaker. Because the editors know the craft so well and they can, you know, they've worked with great 
filmmakers and they work with really crappy filmmakers. And so you, you're developing your craft there. So, and, and to add to that, I think what I learned from, from the editing process is um, it is really the fundamentals that help you to film because when I film or I film with my cinematographer, I already start editing. And if I don't have that experience, then I all, all I shoot is very random. It, it might come together, it might not. But if I'm, so that's number one. The number two where it helps you is certainly in pre-production. If I'm already able to visualize edits in my, or even a film or a whole segment and edit it in my head, well, that comes from the practice of editing. So everything is infused. It's like a writer can never be not writing, being able to write. That is the fundamental. And here it is the same in order to fulfill all the other. Even as a producer, you need to be on some capacity, you know, is this photogenic, this location that I want to give the, the filmmaker, the director, right? Because that's his domain. Is the prop good? And so on. Can you... That is... Abs absolutely critical what you've just said absolutely critical i am always thinking about editing i'm always thinking when i'm interviewing how will this cut did the person say the subject of the question in the answer what does that mean well if i interview you i'm not in the film so if i say shmuel how long have you lived in philadelphia What's your answer? I say four years and nobody knows what four years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I'm always thinking about this. When I'm shooting, I'm thinking, okay, I got that in a wide shot. I need close-ups. And in fact, another secret of, of filming is close-up, 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 close-up. You watch. I have to go in a minute. So let's wrap this up with this. Sure. Everybody that's watching now, tonight, tomorrow, watch a TV show or a movie for 10 minutes with the sound off and count how many moves the camera makes. And I guarantee you, and I, I do this when I do film workshops, I guarantee you that most of the shots are static. Totally. And there's a fantastic film that's about to come out a documentary called um, The Truffle Hunters. It's on the short list for the Oscar. There are almost no moves in the entire film. Not only that, often the camera is locked off and the scene will last two minutes. There's not a zoom, there's not a cutaway, there's not a cut in, there's not a the, the entire film is a lock-off shot. It's remarkable. But watch, watch any television show. My last, count. my last question, that's the in, about you have one minute so that you can go. Talk to me because you started your career with Ken Burns. Talk to me in a nutshell about it. And where are you guys today? Is there any that you move forward or tell me about that? And then we wrap it up. So, okay. We were college roommates. We started Florentine films a year after we graduated. We had to wait for Buddy Squires, who's one of the top directors of photography in the documentary world. We started Florentine films by, we decided not to come to New York. I don't know that I do that now, but, um, we were in Western Massachusetts, stayed around Hampshire area. We sold ourselves to um, European broadcasting. It was a time where magazine shows were happening. There were lots of science shows. There were lots of different things. And we sold ourselves. We drive to, we come to New York and we get meetings with the BB and RAR AI, Italian television, Danish television, French television. Hire us in New England. You don't have to have per diems for your crew. They all had documentary crews. When I started in the business, every major network had a documentary division, which they were starting to close as we got into the business. So maybe we, maybe that was our fault. <coughs> we worked together for quite a few years. Brooklyn Bridge was our first film and our first Oscar nomination. 
But after a while, the, the four, well, a fourth person, Larry Hott, joined a few years later, another friend. Um, after a number of years, we realized that nobody wanted to do the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts, not sexy work of making films. Because most of it is sitting in the office and you know doing whatever you do in the office, pitching and stuff like that. And so after a number of years, we separated our business entities, but all kept the name Florentine Films. It was before Ken became Ken Burns in all caps. And so we all have DBAs. So my company is called Florentine Films Sherman Pictures. So all our contracts are signed, mine are signed Sherman Pictures, but we all share the name Florentine Films because we were very close and we wanted to be a collaboration, an association. And we are still very, very close. I talk to Ken all the time. We don't work together very much because we're all directors. But if we can help each other in any way, we will in an instant. I love it. It was so lovely meeting you here. Um, and I got everything that I wanted to cover. <laughs> oh my God. Not in the same order, but who cares? Because it's a fluid <laughs> process. I thank you so much to you know taking the time here with me. And oh, where can people find you? Tell us. Tell me. Thank you. Um, Florentinefilms.com slash Sherman is my website. You'll see all the the films I've made. You'll see trailers and scenes you'll see my photography all that needs to be updated i'm on instagram at roger sherman films that's the place to really see the up to the minute things and i'm also on facebook you can follow me there but thank you for asking and Shmuel, it's been great to meet you and i hope you know next time i come to philly uh, we'll uh break bread together you know you come for you come for shabbos with your wife I would love that. If it's not COVID, if it's not COVID, we have always a big Shabbos table at our house. That would be fantastic. I would love to Thank see you. Thank you very much. Awesome. I appreciate Thank it very, you. very much. Thank you. Okay. All the best, okay? Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.